Song says, prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. I'm glad God never leaves his position and he never changes his mind about my position in him. First John chapter five, you'll go there with me. First John chapter five for the next few minutes together as we prepare our hearts around the matter of prayer. Uh, we've, we hit all around these themes as we've studied prayer. You know, I started looking back the last couple of weeks, I go back and look and see where we've been and speaking about prayer. And uh, it's been for the better part of a year we've been speaking about prayer on Wednesday evening for, for the most part. It's remarkable to think of that journey. And we've, there's, there's so far to go in the exploring the depths of it all, isn't there? And uh, remarkable. And I think we've touched all around this and made some reference to it. But we're talking about the fact that we can have confidence in receiving answers to our prayers. Do you ever lack confidence? Lots of areas. Uh, we, we, we lack confidence in lots of areas, much less our prayer life. But uh, every once in a while, you may get in a position where you feel like you're a, a square peg trying to be put into a round hole and you don't feel <laughs> very confident about that situation. Ever, been, ever tried to been asked to do something that you really couldn't do, didn't want to do, didn't know how to do, didn't know how this is going to work out? Occasionally that happens. It's happened to me in my life. I've been told to do things I didn't know how to do. I just had to try to figure it out. Because the person that told me was a lot more powerful than me, so I had to get it done. And it didn't turn out very well, but I do the best. You lack confidence. Sometimes we just, people that lack confidence as a matter of their personality. When it comes to my prayer life, I often lack confidence because of my sin nature and my practice of sin. Not just my sin nature, but the fact that I practice sin. Yeah, we practice sin. That's what we do. And some of us have practiced so long, we're really good at it. Uh, I, I know that can be the case in my own life. I'm not here to condemn anybody but myself, but I, I know that confidence, I, I, I speak, speaking of confidence, you know, the Bible talks of confidence, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Philippians chapter 1 and verse 6, I believe, is the reference there. Being confident of this very thing. Often what, what causes my confidence to fail is my lack of diligence and my lack of commitment to Christ. But I'm glad that when it comes to my position in Christ, there's no changing that. Now, we can get into a long discussion about all of that. People debated, debated the, the eternal salvation for thousands of years. We won't settle it tonight. I'm not going to get into that tonight. But when God saves someone, it is eternal. Amen. It's eternal. That's why the Bible calls it eternal salvation. But how long can you lose eternal salvation? I don't really see how you can lose an eternal salvation. But we can argue about that another time, maybe. We can talk about it another time may not be exciting to some people. It's exciting to a lot of others. But it's eternal salvation. But you and I struggle, and our, God doesn't struggle when he looks at us, but we struggle when we look to him because we know what's between us and him. Uh, we know what's between us and him, and it's very, very difficult at times to deal with that. And of course, we've been taught to pray here years ago. We pray the acts, right? As we come to the Lord, we pray in adoration. We pray in confession. We pray in thanksgiving. Then we pray in supplication, trying to take their care of things with God. I think, I think what that does, it helps us a lot more than it helps God. I think that helps me a lot more than it helps God because my salvation is eternal. And I'm not, I'm not trying to, to dismiss how God views sin. We know that the Lord, God himself, turned his back on Jesus Christ when Jesus became sin on the cross. God hates sin. But we can have confidence not in ourselves, but confidence in God. In fact, while I'm using the word confidence, let me just take a little sidebar and say, you can have confidence in God about anything he's called you to do. Not in yourself. So we, we, we sing a song uh, there. I enjoy singing. Is my confidence in the Lord when I sing? I don't know if I can say that wholeheartedly. God's given me a measure of talent that I've used and abused for now for the last 25 or 30 years, and there's not as much of my voice as there used to be. But still loud, by the way. I think you, you just figured that out. But, um, but not as much there. But where, where does, I don't know where talent ends and spiritual gifts begin. There's a lot, lot to talk about in all of that. Somebody said your, 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 spiritual, your talent is something that you do without, having to really, uh, w without really working too hard at it. That's your talent. I'm not sure your spiritual gift is that, is that very thing, however. I'm not sure about that. That's a whole other subject, but what am I trying to say? So when I stand before you all to sing, I've sung thousands of times in my life, 
And uh, just because I have, have, God's given me the opportunity, not about me, it's about the Lord. And so there's a measure of confidence that you may have in doing that. I've also gotten up many times and, and sat down with less confidence than I got up with because what happened while I was singing, that uh, I didn't, didn't do well, I didn't prepare well, whatever, whatever happened. Uh, but confidence, I'm talking about confidence. Anything that God's given you to do, you can have confidence in him about doing it. Anything. So I hear people say, I, I, I could never be called to preach because there's no way I could ever speak in front of people. Well, if God called you to do that, you could have confidence in the Lord about doing that. Amen. See, I could never be a missionary to a farm field because I'm too afraid to do this or to leave home or to be this far from whatever. If God calls you to do that, you can have a confidence not in yourself, but in the God who gave you the calling. And it's difficult sometimes to separate the confidence we have in ourselves because we have a certain talent or a certain willingness or a certain way to figure things out and separate that from the confidence we have in God when it comes to our performance. In a Sunday school class, you may have no trouble looking at a Sunday school lesson, putting it together and delivering it to a group of children or a group of adults. And you have a lot of confidence in yourself because you've done it before. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about a confidence in God. A confidence in God. In our performance, many times we trust, we have some, a, a certain confidence in ourselves when it comes to working in the nursery or working in the bus ministry or, or working in the, doing something in the choir or in Sunday school ministry, whatever ministry we have, the nursing home ministry, you name it, the list goes on and on around here, thank God. Because we've done it before, we've been there, we've seen it, we know how it goes, I feel confident about this. We, in our performance, we may have some level of confidence in ourselves that may be a little bit shallow, but it's there. But when our prayer life comes, our confidence had better be in God. So it doesn't matter how many times we've prayed, does it? It doesn't matter how good you are. It doesn't matter how well-versed you are in the, in the verbiage of prayer, the, you know, the, the Christian lingo that we use in prayer, the, the, the phrases that we twist and turn that, that fit well, and uh, they're all, all, almost uh, synchronized in a sense amongst God's people. This is the confidence in 1 John chapter 5 and verse 14. This is the confidence that we have in him. That if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. And if we know that he hear us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desired of him. There are many things, many points to all this. Tonight, I just want to talk about the confidence that we can have in him. Confidence that we have in him. And you will, if you're like me, <coughs> pardon me. You struggle because of your own issues, because of, you know, who you are. But if you're in Christ, and you can be in Christ and still deal with sin in your life, you and I know who we are. We, we, we understand what we're capable of and how much we fall and how weak we are and maybe how close we are to the precipice at times of, of really making a mess of our life because of sin, even though we're in the family of God. But we can have confidence not in ourselves, but confidence in him. Is there anything about your prayer life that demonstrates a confidence in God? In my prayer life, that demonstrates a confidence in God. Spurgeon said this. He, 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 of course, Spurgeon was known as a great warrior for God, and many have said a confident prayer warrior. He said, reflecting on prayer, he said, oh, that every single Christian enterprise were commenced with prayer, continued with prayer, and crowned with prayer. Then might we also expect to see it crowned with God's blessing. So once again, I remind you that our Savior's example teaches us, he says, that for seasons of special service, we need not only prayers of, of a brief character, excellent as they are for ordinary occasions, but special protracted wrestling with God, like that of Jacob at the brook Jabbok, so that each one of us can say to the Lord with holy determination, like Jacob said, with thee all night, I will be able to stay and wrestle till the break of day. Spurgeon went on to say, when such sacred persistence in prayer as this becomes common throughout the whole church of Christ, Satan's long usurpation will be coming to an end. And we shall be able to say to our Lord, as the 70 disciples did when they returned to him with joy, even the devils are subject unto us through thy name. Here in 1 John chapter 5, we know that the Lord hears our prayers. He answers our prayers. This is the assurance that we have, the confidence that we have. God in his omniscience knows and hears our prayers. In his omnipotence, he answers our prayers. Mr. Torrey, R.A. Torrey, the great revivalist, said prayer is the key that unlocks all the storehouses of God's infinite grace and power. All that God is and all that God has is at the disposal of prayer, but we must use 
the key. And our confidence not in ourselves, but our confidence in him. We don't have to bear burdens alone. Thank the Lord. We can leave our burdens with the Lord. We have the privilege of bringing our cares and concerns to the Lord in prayer. And, and we, as we examine this thought of having our prayers heard, our prayers answered, being confident about that, John really helps us to understand some things as he teaches us here in these verses. Let me give you a few thoughts. Uh, if you may want to jot some of these things down or they've been a help to me, I hope they'll be a help to you. Here he speaks of the confidence that we have as we pray. What is, and the word confidence here, interestingly enough, as we looked all this up here and, and tried to study what others have said, this word confidence means a freedom of speech. It's interesting. So it's a twist on the word of confidence. So what that is is a freedom to speak freely. You ever, have you ever had to speak to someone and you had to really watch what you would say? Not because you would say a bad word, excuse me, but because you, you knew that you just had to speak a certain way to someone or speak a, about a certain thing to someone. Uh, they, they, they just, they, you weren't going to have their attention if you didn't come a certain way. You couldn't just be yourself. You had to take it up a notch or two. Maybe you've gone before the judge. <laughs> uh, man, I remember when we, had, we, had the, uh, when we were dealing with the stormwater issue years ago. And we went to court a couple of times, and it took longer to get to court than it did to be in court. It took longer to get to court. I mean, I'm talking about parking my car and walking in the building. Uh, and then I got inside the building, and, and we, we, uh, some comments were made on one side, some comments were made on our side, and it seemed like before we knew what happened, the judge was not having any part of it. I think he made a big mistake. That's another, another thing for another day. But, but I noticed the way those lawyers spoke to one another uh, before everything took place in the courtroom. These two men, the men representing our side of the thing, uh, had, had something to do, but he also knew the men who were on the other side, and they were, they were, they were like comrades. I, that made me a little nervous, but they were friendly to one another. I'm used to having opposition, but in that situation, obviously it's a little different. It's not like we're playing football or boxing one another. We're in a court of law. So these men were very somewhat joking. Hey, how are you? Hey, how are you? How is this? How's that? All that. When the judge walked in, it got, we all stood we all got quiet, and they started to speak very differently. Your Honor, they spoke to him. Now, even though they spoke very politely in a very decent way, they did not have a freedom of speech just to speak to him like they were speaking uh, to their, their friend a moment ago. Now, I'm not trying to say that we should say it, speak to the Lord in any way that, 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 uh, that cries out against the Lord's holiness and dignity. I'm not, I'm not talking about that, but I'm talking about a familiarity. This idea of having a, this is the confidence that we have, meaning that we have a freedom to come to the Lord, we feel free to come to the Lord. Uh, it was a, this was a political term in that day referring to speaking your opinion without hesitation in an open assembly. This is the confidence that we have in him. Now, you know, we can speak to the Lord pretty clearly, pretty directly. We ought to respect our Lord. He's a God of very gods. He's the God of the universe. He's the one that provided our salvation. But, you know, we, it makes sense that we can have a confidence of freedom to speak to the Lord freely. We don't necessarily have to be someone that we're not or speak a way that we're not really capable of when we come to the Lord. He already knows our thoughts, right? Every time you think you have to dust yourself off and clean yourself up, remember, you can't fool God. We might as well, in a sense, we come to him as we are. And we have a confidence in him. This is the confidence that we have. It reminds us of the privilege that we have to tell the Lord what's on our heart and mind. And God's not necessarily interested in eloquence. There's some people that have a natural proclivity to beautiful speech and to heartfelt sentiment, even as they speak to the Lord. But God does not require eloquence. But he certainly wants us to be earnest, doesn't he? That's what he means. This is the confidence that we can have. Like, he accepts me. I know he's way up here and I'm way down here, but he accepts me. He wants to hear me. He wants to hear me call unto him. He wants to hear me talk to him. I can have confidence in him because I'm accepted in the beloved. I'm accepted in the family of God. He has brought me, I've been made nigh by the blood of Jesus Christ. I'm not trying to be something or someone I'm not when I come into the presence of the Lord. But often I've done that, especially when I pray publicly. Anybody else ever feel guilty about that? Maybe when I pray publicly, I'm trying to be something that I'm not. You know, that, that's because it's not about me and the Lord anymore. It's about me and you hearing me talk to the Lord. Thank God we can have a confidence of freedom of speech. We have a confidence. We have both access to the Lord. We have an audience before him. We don't have to twist his arm. We don't have to keep tugging on his sleeve. Daddy, 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 daddy. What? 
That's what we do at our house. That's how we do at our house. Usually somebody's got, they don't necessarily have a hold of me, but what happens is uh, if you have more than one child, you understand that just because one child is having a conversation with you does not mean that the other one is not going to try to have a conversation with you uh, at the same time. And uh, I just, I, I can't handle it. I can't handle it. Pray for me. You have to twist God's arm or bribe him to hear us. Mueller said, prayer is not overcoming God's reluctance. It's laying a hold of his willingness. We have confidence in that. Have a freedom of speech in that. Ephesians chapter 3 reminds us we have a boldness and an access with confidence to approach the Lord. Hebrews chapter 4 reminds us in verse 16, Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in a time of need. We have this confidence. The reason we have this confidence as we approach the Lord in prayer is because he has fashioned a relationship with us. I was going to say because we have a relationship with him. No, it's because he has created a relationship with us. He's initiated a relationship with us. He initiated it. He sought after us. He came after me. God's the one that said, I want you to be saved, Greg. God's the one that looked at you, whatever you think you are. And if you're like me, you don't think much of yourself, especially don't think you're worthy of God's mercy. But God came after me. He pursued me. He initiated this relationship. That gives me some level of confidence and freedom of speech there. Thank God for that. The reason we have the confidence is because of the relationship that he has fashioned for us. We're, re we're reminded of our relationship here. It says in verse 14 of 1 John chapter 4, and this is the confidence that we have in him. That little preposition in carries a lot of weight, doesn't it? We're in him. We're in him. Close proximity to we're in him because we've trusted Christ as our Savior. And if you're in Christ, one commentator says you're in the bosom of the Heavenly Father. It's literally like you're sitting on his lap and talking with him in an unhurried and an intimate fellowship. You have, believe it or not, even though right now you're one of 7.7 .7 billion people in the earth, you have God's undivided attention. And this is the confidence that we have in him. This is the confidence that we have in him. And so we come to the Lord realizing this. We're sitting in his lap. He's listening to us. Someone said prayer is like whispering in the ear of God. He has condescended to us. That means God is taking time to listen to us. This is the confidence that we have in him. That means he's taking time to bend down to hear what we have to say attentively. He draws near. Sincerely, he draws near. Compassionately, he draws near. He wants to know what's on our heart, or he wants us to say what's on our heart, I should say. And certainly, <laughs> that makes sense, doesn't it? We've heard preachers refer to the fact that the devil trembles when he sees the weakest Christian on his knees. And thank God the weakest Christian can get a hold of God the Father. Because this is the confidence that we have in him. In him. There's a confidence that we have in him. The weakest Christian can get a hold of God the Father in prayer. Because we are in him. His confidence is not in our prayer, however, remember. You know, your salvation was not, your salvation is not necessarily, is not because of prayer. The salvation you enjoy in him is because of faith that was given to you. Prayer, prayer is the recognition of what God has done. Prayer is, this, is maybe, a, maybe a, a, a visible symbol of the submission and the acceptance and, and the repentance. But all that is a spiritual work that God does. Prayer does not save people. Faith saves people. And prayer is not the key. It, it is, it's God, God is the key. It's the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Our faith is still, is still ne is a necessity, not only in our salvation, but also in our relation to the Lord. So just praying isn't the key, but praying in confidence, in faith, freely speaking to him, knowing that we're in him, and we approach the Father in the name of the Son. John chapter 14 and verse 13, it says, And whatsoever you shall ask in my name. That's what Jesus said. It's no small thing that we pray in the name of Jesus Christ. You have no access otherwise. You say, well, that's just a phrase we say. I want you to know that phrase is vital to the effectiveness of our prayers. 
The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much, but it cannot be had without praying to the one we have access, and that's Jesus Christ. John says we ask anything. He says we're assuring us we can never ask anything that's beyond the Lord's ability. It's not. And we, we understand Ephesians chapter 3. And now to him that's able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. Uh, he can do above what we can ask or think. I don't know what your imagination is like, but God's power is bigger. God's ability is bigger. And it's not just a funny thing that we say. It's not just a cute little statement that we make. It's the truth of God's word. But I remind you again, just, just like we said a moment ago, that nothing is impossible with God. Most of us are not thinking about trying to see, I, 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 what, what could I say? Something that seems impossible. Like so, so maybe, maybe this would seem impossible. I'm sure it would seem impossible. I would like to witness to a thousand people between now and Sunday. God help me to do that. that that's a righteous effort. So that's a great thing. If you could do that, that would be awesome. That would be an amazing thing. It's not, maybe it's not impossible and God could help me if I got a thousand tracks. And I spent my time the next few days. I might get close to something like that. Or you could say this, I want to give a million dollars to International World Missions next year, personally. That seems impossible. That's a righteous goal. You pray for something like that, say, wow! We want to do something that, we want to accomplish something that we can't do. And sometimes, as I said earlier, as I refer to that song, Nothing is Impossible, we try to, we, we want to get into those things. Part of, our, part of it is because our flesh is enamored with, the, with what could be accomplished so he's able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. Does that work for someone who is so addicted to illegal substances? Can they claim that verse too? It's not about accomplishing something. It may be about absolutely cutting something off that seems impossible, that won't stop, won't stop, won't stop. Like the Lord said to Cain, sin is lieth at the door. Sometimes it feels like, like sin has literally grown nails and is scratching on the door. You ever get that feeling in your life? All you got to do is open the door one second, and it's going to storm in and over, overcome you. Scratching at your door. We, we say God can do exceedingly abundantly above all we can ask or think. Yeah, things like this. I want to build a, we want to build a church building. We want to reach the world. We want to see this done. We want to see that done. But what about just living for God and dealing with the sin that won't leave us alone? And this is the confidence that we have in him. That if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. According to his will, he heareth us. Listen, there's so many applications there. John describes prayer by these words of asking in verse 14. And, and he uses the word petitions down in verse 15. This idea of asking obviously indicates that there's an inferior personality reaching out to a superior personality, asking something of someone. Verse 15, the, the word there is mentioned, if, 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 and if we know that he heareth, we, and we know that he hear us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desired of him. This word desired, it comes from the same root word, wanting something. Prayer is simply coming to God with certain desires and ask him to meet those desires. Matthew chapter 7, verse 7, I have it in my notes, it says, ask what and it shall be given you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. The word petitions as well is given to us in these verses, asking for a particular thing. And I've spoken about this before. I've been taught about this, and I've tried to practice this in life, but I've tried to be better at praying more specifically. Because you know what? I'm talking about the confidence that we have in him, the freedom to ask him for things that are in his will. We'll talk about some of the requirements at another time. I'm just talking about the confidence right now. The confidence that we have to say things that may sound foolish. Things that may sound impossible. Things that may be absolutely unknowable. Ask and it shall be given you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. These petitions here, asking for a particular thing. You know, our faith is really exercised when we get specific with God. Faith is demonstrated when we get specific with God. God bless everybody. God save the whole world. It takes no faith to pray those prayers. When we say, God, God save Larry. God save Larry, that requires some faith. 
right? God save everybody, that's a nice prayer, but it's not very specific, and it takes no confidence, and it takes no faith to pray without specificity. Where are, where, and the, the things that I specifically pray for are the things that I really desire. Those really are petitions. Those really are petitions. And those are things we can have confidence. Prayer, prayer is coming to ask God with per, per, particular requests, not general ones. We are to pray fervently, continually, patiently, but we're to pray specifically. Do you have enough confidence in God to pray specifically? Do I have enough faith in God to pray specifically? God, help me. God, we need this amount of money. Occasionally we'll hear people pray that way or talk about praying that way. And they'll say, then God, God did this. God did that. Whatever the case may be. God, we need this done by this time. I don't want to get outside of God's will and put God in any sort of box, but uh, I believe we can pray specifically when God gives us liberty to do it. You know, we just, you know, if, if, if Larry needs to be saved, let's pray get saved by Christmas. Let's pray get saved by Easter. Let's, let's get serious about it, being specific. And, and not just leave it, leave it to whatever. And again, God's in control of all of that. I'm not trying to wrestle away whatever God's will is, but where is the confidence in our prayers? And let's put it this way. I don't want my prayers to be a waste of time. If they're not expressed in faith and they're not expressed in confidence, if they're just some ritual and practice where we speak to the Lord and there's no, no faith expressed, maybe I shouldn't use the, the phraseology of wasting our time, but God has said, this is the confidence that we can have in him, that if you ask anything according to his will, anything according to his will. Thank God as the children of God, we, we're, we, we have a living God. We have the Father to come to. The Father delights in, in his Son. He delights in us because we've been adopted into his family through the Son. He doesn't withhold any good thing from his Son. He won't withhold any good thing for us. He has already given us the greatest treasure in the Lord Jesus Christ. And shall not he give us freely all other things according to his will? And this is the confidence that we can have. Would he really withhold anything else? Would he really withhold anything else? Romans 8, 32 says this, And he that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? I remind you, the confidence that we have is not based even on our abilities. Let me say one other thing. Our confidence in our prayers uh, being answered are not based on a previously answered prayers. I read an article about this earlier today that someone wrote and says some, some people are just inquisitive and have so much wonder in their heart that God could answer a prayer and they'd still wonder if God did it or if it just happened that way. We sit and try to Monday morning quarterback everything. Listen, and, and, and I always say, oh, did this happen? Did God do this because I prayed for it? It was just something that God was going to do anyway. We can ask lots of weird questions like that about our prayer life. Maybe that's going digging a little too deep. But our confidence in God is not even because of our ability. Certainly, we've established that. We're sinners and we need help, even to save people. It should not even be because God has answered prayer in the past. That's nice, but that's not where our confidence is. It's not, our confidence shouldn't even just be based on God's performance. You understand what I'm saying? It's not just based on his performance. Our confidence is based not on what he does, but who he is. And this is the confidence that we can have in him. If we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. We'll talk more at a later time about what he requires in all of this, but he, he is wanting to answer our prayers. And there's no way to outpray God. No, and what I mean, outpray God's resource, outpray God's ability to overstep what God wants to do in our lives. And I just wonder how far beneath, I'm, how far below I'm living, how far I'm living below all that what God actually could and would do in my life just because I lack this confidence in him because I have no confidence in myself. Now, if there's a place for me to get right with God, I ought to get right with God and eliminate that lack of confidence. So we confess our sins. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If, my, if some of that confidence issue is in coming to the Lord or what keeps me from coming to the Lord is the fact that I have sin in my life, get it out. Get it out. But remember, even my, my, the increase in my righteous living, temporary though may it be, 
It's not where my confidence is. My confidence is in him, that he's trustworthy. Let's pray that way. Drive that point home in your heart. You know why? If you'll believe that, it'll get you back to him when you're away from him. I believe if I can recognize that truth in my life, I'll, get, I'll come back to God in Christian repentance, so to speak, much sooner. Because I'm not even trusting in my own sorrow and in my own reflection. I'm trusting in him. God, help me. God, help me. Father, thank you for the, how reliable you are. Thank you for allowing us to speak to you with confidence. Thank you for bringing us in to your family. Thank you for the blood of Jesus. Thank you that even when we are far away from you, we can still have confidence in you. Lord, may we not place our prayer, our prayer life in the confidence of our, our abilities, even past answered prayer. May we place our confidence not in even what you do and what you've done. Even those are wonderful things to consider. May we place our confidence in the, who you say you are in your word. And may we pray in confidence. Help us have a closeness with you. Help us to sit in your lap tonight and whisper in your ear with confidence that you hear and answer our prayers. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.